and we are going to pray for, he brings a host with him. And it is an honor to have one of our U.S. Senators. And we want him to go back full of the power of God. So we're going to pray for him tonight. You that have never met him, you're going to get to meet him. This is the first time that he has been a family Christian center. Quite a, I am excited because uh, I've often longed for a U.S. Senator in the state of Indiana to come to Northwest Indiana. Now he's coming tonight and we're going to get to pray for him. And we're going to let him say something to you for a few minutes and then I will teach on the seven blessings of atonement. I'm very excited about that. God is moving in a wonderful way. This week is going to be great. Please, please, everybody, remember that what you're going through, the devil is doing. He's throwing everything at you. You've got to understand what's going on. If you don't, you will get discouraged. You'll blame God. You'll blame somebody else. You'll blame yourself. You, if you know the battle plans, if you know and you're not ignorant of the devil's devices, then you know you are just days away from miracles happening. And are they ever more happening? Well, I'm excited. We're going to go into the service. The service is going to get started. And we're going to go into praise and worship. Turn the volume up. Clap your hands. Lift your hands. Sing along. And, and enter into his presence with singing. This is a great moment to start with praise and worship. Then we're going to pray for you. We're going to pray for you. We're going to pray that God touches you and that God heals you and God delivers you. And then you're going to see the introduction of Senator Brom. We're so excited about his leadership. And we're going to, we're going to pray for Washington. We need to pray for America. And this is our time we get to pray for America. And uh, there's some surprises we're going to give you in just a few minutes. So let's go into Big Wednesday night and get ready for God to do something special in your life.
Jesus is more powerful and stronger than anything we need. Amen. Father, we lean into that tonight.
Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. That name, the Bible says, is above every other name. It's above cancer. It's above doubt. It's above fear. Say it again with me. Jesus. Jesus. He said, do all things in my name. Pray in my name. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And when you say Jesus, all evil and darkness and spirits, they run. They can't stand that name. Jesus. Say it again with me. Jesus. 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 Tonight we're going to pray and we're praying biblical prayers in John 3, which is a book in the back of the New Testament, John 1, John 2, and John 3. He also wrote St. John in the front of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, St. John. Then he wrote a book called 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. Then he also wrote the book of Revelation. He was the one that went to Calvary. He was the only one of the disciples that was at Calvary, John. John at 90 years of age suffered the consequences to be Jesus' disciple. Nero burned him in oil, tried to kill him, put him in a cauldron of boiling oil at 90 years of age. They asked him to deny the name of Jesus. He said, no, I'd rather be boiled in oil then deny the name of Jesus. Can I get somebody real strong for the name of Jesus? Real strong for the name of Jesus. But John lived. They could not kill him. It demolished his whole body. They, hire, they, they put him, they wrapped him up and they put him in a boat and they hauled him to the Isle of Patmos. And that's where he got the revelation of the book Revelation. He lived 10 years longer. They took him back to Ephesus. But John, listen, John, who went through all of that, the youngest disciple, who wrote St. John, the famous scripture, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's John 3, 16. But I want you to notice what John says. Think about this. A man that's burned in oil, man that followed Jesus, man that wrote these books listen to what he says to all of us and i read beloved i wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in hell even as thy soul prosper that means he knew the revelation of jesus and he believed he believed that we should prosper in fact the bible says god gets pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. It is the will of God for us to prosper. It is the will of God to say, we will not fear. It is the will of God to say, I believe. It is the will of God for us to say, I believe my dreams can come to pass and God will help. Do I have anybody here that... I, I, beloved, I wish above all things, so I'm going to pray for your jobs. I'm going to pray for your money. I'm going to pray where you are in life. And if you don't have enough, we're going to believe that God is going to provide something better. God knows right where you are. God knows exactly what you need. And so in the name of Jesus is my first prayer for everyone watching. And there are many that are watching live streaming. And in the name of Jesus, I believe, Lord, that every person that needs that touch to progress. Lord, they need their steps to be ordered. Oh God, bless them. 
Bless them on their job. Bless them with their abilities. Bless them with scholarships. Bless them with their children. Lord, just prosper them. Just, just Lord, let them have favor, oh God. And Lord, just lead them so that they will be able to experience the prosperity that you have for them. And everybody say, in the name of Jesus, I receive the prosperity from the Lord. Now, if anybody questions about God and his prosperity, you should turn to Deuteronomy where God said, I give you power to get wealth. I didn't misquote that. I said, I didn't misquote that. The Bible says, God, I give you power to get wealth. And, when, and then he turns around, and this is God saying, he said, now if you claim and say, I did it, I got the scholarship, I went to college, this is what I did, God said, I'll testify against you. Because the only way God says that you're going to achieve, I'll give you power. I'll give you power to it. Anybody want to give him a hand clap for Lord giving us power to get to the next level, to get to those things that we need in life? Second thing we're going to pray tonight, we're going to pray for your health. I believe God can heal cancer. I believe God can heal sickle cell anemia. I believe that God can heal from ailments. Now, I know people have said, well, we don't believe in that any longer. But I want to tell you, there's a backside of Calvary. There's a backside. We all walk to the front and we get salvation and say, Lord, you died for me. But there's a backside. And on the backside, the Bible says he took stripes. They beat his back. And specifically, the Bible says he did that and allowed that so that by his stripes, we are healed. So I want to declare, I want to declare whatever sickness whatever illness in the name of Jesus let the power of healing come upon your body Lord touch them right now and in the name of Jesus say it with me in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus by his stripes by his stripes we are healed we are healed and if there's anybody here tonight that you need a touch I'm believing that the Lord is going to touch you he's going to heal you I believe in divine healing. You see, if you come to me and say, I don't believe that, you should have been with Melody and I a few years ago when our granddaughter had 90% Hodgkin's cancer disease. And we were up at the University of Chicago and the doctor walks in and says, she's got days to live. The chemotherapy took all her hair out. There she is, skin bones in the bed. And so the doctor says, you need to say goodbye. It's over for Chantel. We cried. We said, oh, no, she's too young. But you know what? I read in the Bible where the Bible says he will heal. He, it, just ask him to heal. Ask him to, for healing. I'm so glad tonight that we just kept believing, kept praying for Chantel. It was about four or five weeks later, the doctor said, I don't know what's going on, but we did another test and whatever was in her body is not in her body. And she's alive and well today. You come too late to tell me. God, don't heal. He heals. He heals. And so for every person that's watching that needs that touch, in the name of Jesus, may the Lord touch you and may he heal you. And everybody say, oh Lord, oh Lord I thank you, I thank you for, healing. for healing. Now what about the soul? That's the third thing John said. Well, the soul is divided up into three areas. Our mind, our emotions, our emotions, our mind. You know what? God can heal your mind. God can take a hold of your emotions. And God can rescue you. So if there's anybody depressed here tonight, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. If there's anybody that is feeling empty, I pray for your soul. And everybody say, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We pray. We pray. For all souls. For all souls. 
in the name of Jesus, in the, name of Jesus. the will of man the will of man the emotions of man the emotions of man the mind of man the mind of man and in the name of Jesus and in the name of Jesus let it prosper let it prosper in Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name now you know what i think that god's going to answer our prayer to some of these so why don't we give him a hand clap and say thank you lord thank you lord we worship you lord we give you all the praise. And everybody shout a great big amen. Amen. Turn to three or four people and say, something good's going to happen to you tonight. And then you may be seated. Watch this. and Iraq are facing water shortages as the region's longest river, the Euphrates, dries up. Air raid sirens blared out across the capital. Ukraine woke to explosions around the capital, Kiev. A meteor confirmed to have entered Earth's atmosphere, likely over the Northern Territory. Massive protest in Israel. Hundreds of thousands of Israelis rallied against the move. A revival lasting not hours, but days. Dealing this morning from another deadly earthquake. We're still dealing with extreme... That we are living in the end time. Pray for America. How many believe we ought to pray for America? How many believe in America? Now, this is the first Wednesday night where all adjustments and school and etc. So everybody's getting adjusted. But tonight we have with us our U.S. Senator from Indiana, Mike Braun. He is a U.S. Senator. That means that he's got an office in D.C. He is among the U.S. Senators, and he's our Indiana Senator. But he's decided to do something, and that is he wants to be the governor of Indiana. So I just want to tell you, he's a successful businessman. He's done, he's done very well as a U.S. Senator. He, um, you can check his record out. And he is a very, very good man. He is a Christian man. He loves God. And he is here tonight. And so I want to hear, for us that live in Indiana, I want to hear from our U.S. Senator. Would you give him a great big hand, Mike Braun. Pastor Muncy, I come from a place where faith, family, community is the most important thing. But I've never heard the roof raised the way you folks did tonight. I don't know who's coming up with the hymns, but if you aren't feeling the Lord Jesus Christ in a place like this, You've got to be hard of hearing because that was amazing. That was amazing. So we all come from a different pathway in life, and I think we all want to end up in the same place with the good Lord sooner or later. And some of what I heard this evening, and I've never been quite in an atmosphere like this, and I can say you're all lucky to be in a congregation like this. Give yourselves a hand. My wife and I grew up in a little town about as far away from here and still being in Indiana, 40 miles north of the Ohio River. Jasper, Indiana in Dubois County. Sometimes gets mixed up with Jasper County just south of you. We, many years ago, had to make a decision. We were just 24 years old and never lived out of our hometown until we lived in Boston for two years. And never in our wildest dreams did we imagine that we would move back to our hometown. Often wondered when we were dead set on leaving, staying away, 
making a life somewhere else, who guided you to make that decision? I know now that came from upstairs. I literally was headed to Wall Street out of business school. That didn't seem right. We wanted to raise a family, didn't know if we could. We did. The good Lord blessed us with four kids, two sons, two daughters, and believe it or not, I got seven grandkids. How about that? The true blessings in life. My wife has had her own business in our town town for 45 years. That was her dream. I ended up not going to Wall Street, moving back, had a little business for a long time that be became successful over many, many years. But the thing I treasure most it was a guidance that we got even when I wasn't asking for it back in 78 that put us on that trajectory. You never know where life's going to take you. Sometimes it can take you to your hometown and somewhere else and back and then even to the U.S. Senate, believe it or not. But every day, every step of the, along the way, and I came from a faith-based faith family and community. I never put two and two together until I started seeing what you said, anything we get is a gift. And it's a gift from above, and as long as you keep that humility, the good Lord will take care of you. When I decided not to spend another six years in the Senate, even though I got a little over a year to finish it out, and I will in all of our best interests, I think we're all lucky we live in a community like you have, in a state like Indiana. And thank the good Lord every day that you have benefited from that, to raise your families, build your lives. And if you support me for governor, I'm not going to be coached on what's n the most important variable. I'll ask for guidance from upstairs every day. That will be my priority, and it's going to be based upon faith, family, community. You guys have it here. I'll make sure more people can get it throughout our state. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. I just want you to stay right here, and Tony is helping, um, is helping our senator. And of course, we have uh, our state representative, Mike Andreas. He's been very faithful to help us in many areas, and I appreciate him because we're getting ready to pray, Senator, for all of our leaders. And I really love this guy. He, did, he doesn't come very much. He came to my birthday, but this is Chief Steve Sheckle of the Munster Police Department. Yeah. You all clap loud so you won't get tickets, so, you know, this is the chief right there. But I want to thank our chief because uh, they didn't know what they were going to do 45th new. And he just said, man, we got to do it. It's just too bumpy. And so we, we just thank God for the town board giving us a brand new road. And thanks Steve Shackle for really stepping up. How I many love our new road? That's a great, beautiful new road. And we pray for him. We pray for our leaders. Stand up. We're going to pray for our leaders in the United States of America. And our senator, you represent all of the leaders in D.C. You represent Indianapolis. You represent the community. And, and let me just say that the Bible teaches us we are to pray for our leaders. And, and that, let, me, let me give you a note of encouragement and also education from the Bible. After a person is voted in, that doesn't mean because you didn't win your vote, you stop praying. You pray even for the one you didn't vote for. Uh, that was weak. I said you pray for the person until the next, until the next opportunity of the democracy that we live in because we are to pray for our leaders. 
You may say, well, that leader is not good. Well, maybe because we haven't prayed enough. But we, the church, have a responsibility. We are not political in our thinking. We are spiritual when it comes. We must pray for our leaders. Every day, I pray for our president. Every day, I pray for our Congress. I pray. I mean, I make that a point. I call out my chief's name. I call out Bernie Carter's name. Call out Mike's name. I've even called out our senator's name. And this is the first time I met him. And I love the way he talks about faith. Didn't you like, didn't you like that dialogue of faith? And I know that our country could be better. And when I get to that point in which I'm to make a decision personally and you make that decision, then you make that decision and you, you vote that person you feel would be the best. But now we are to pray for our leaders. We are to pray for them. We are to pray for Secretary of State. We are to pray for our representatives, our governors, our police departments, our fire department. So everybody, stretch your hands toward these leaders and say with me, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus we, ask you, we ask you, touch our leaders, touch our leaders of, our land. of our land. We ask you, Lord, we ask you, Lord you will touch Washington, D.C. All of those leaders. All of those leaders. Lord, touch, Lord, touch each state. Each state. Illinois. Illinois. Indiana. Indiana. Lord, touch, Lord, touch our, counties, our counties. Our towns. Our, towns, our, cities, our cities. Touch Munster. Touch, Munster. touch our chief. Touch our representative. Touch our representative. And, God, and God, we are not perfect. We are not perfect. So forgive us. So forgive us. Bless our nation. Bless our nation. Don't let the things that we do wrong. Don't let the things that we do wrong affect you. Affect you from blessing us. From blessing us. Forgive us. Forgive us. And forgive, those and forgive those that don't do right. That don't do right. But, oh God, but, oh God, let your grace, let your grace and, your mercy and your mercy come to our nation. Come to, our nation. To, come to my block. Come to, my block. Come to where I live. Come to where, I live. Where, my children go to school. where my children go to school. And in the name of Jesus. And in the name of Jesus. Bless America. Bless America. Bless America. Bless America. God bless America. Land and power. Stand beside.
FCC and Operation Care invite you to the 2023 Hunger Hike, Saturday, September 23rd. Through your participation, you help feed thousands of families in need. It's a day of community where you can walk, run, or bike for a special cause. You can register by scanning the QR code or visit one of our teams in the lobby. Thank you for your generosity, and we'll see you September 23rd at the 2023 Hunger Hike. How many? Turn my mic on. How many's glad to be here tonight? I want to talk about the hunger um, hike. I almost said strike. We are we are raising money, and what happens is is all of Northwest Indiana we partner in and other churches and other people, but we are probably the forerunners of giving out food here in Northwest Indiana through Operation Care. And you need to note that the food, the food bank through the government allows us to get food at prices that uh, are below the average so we can feed people. Now I want you to note this, that Right now, at this moment, you may not because you're blessed. When, you know, when you're blessed, when God blesses you, sometimes you don't know the pain of what's going on in the real world of people that don't know how to be blessed. But at this moment, we are feeding more people because the interest rates are high and whatever is going on in our economics, people are suffering severely. We have an Operation Care building, which is on Klein and Ridge Road in that area. And, and so we have 30 to 40 volunteers and we feed people. This has been going on for years. And we have fed over 700,000 families or whatever that figure is, I don't know exactly, but here's, here's, the, here's the key. I need you to stop and pick up a brochure and sponsor or go with us to the county fairgrounds in Crown Point and everybody will be walking and this is all uh, this is uh, everybody this is uh, Democrats Republicans this is people go to church people don't don't go to church and we are participating in helping the main food bank so that we're raising funds for that even though that we purchase from them they need help also so that we can get we can get uh, food at the food bank so we can get it from the food bank. That's one of our resources. So this is a very worthy cause. Now, you can walk, run, bike. Uh, you can do whatever you need to do to be in this um, uh, hunger hike, which is uh, the dates are, uh, they probably can put it up on the, uh, you know, the screen there. Uh, and it's only a week or so away. So, like, I'm going to sponsor people. That's at 9 to 12 p.m. You can walk with us there in uh, the county fairgrounds there in Lake County. And uh, it's September 23rd. And so let's do a good job. Give, give to somebody. Sponsor somebody. Let's go over the top. Everybody say, let's go over the top. And this is, uh, we, we've got to help people. How many know we've got to help people? And let, let, me, let, me, let me help you get excited about this. The Bible says that when you give to the poor, you lend money to God. I'm going to repeat that. God says when you give money to the poor, you lend money to God. How many know God pays his bills? So when you're giving to the hunger, for, uh, uh, you know, to this cause, 
the key is you're actually feeding people who need food. And when you give, God sees you give, he's going to repay. He's going to bless you. So there's, there's, a, there's a blessing from the Lord when it comes to giving. And I know you are giving people. Thank you. You are giving people. So please, please participate in that because that's going to be good. Also, I want to say we are right at, how many schools do we have, Pastor Poet, right now? The, the number is right about 300 or 280. Huh? We're at 294 schools. Everybody get your school in. Walk up to the school where you live in your neighborhood, put your hand on the school building, and say, Lord, let there be no shootings in this building. Number two, let angels and let there be peace in the hallways. And number three, Lord, we ask you to touch every student and every teacher. It's a simple prayer. Lay your hands on it. Get that name of the school into our website. I then write them a letter to say that you prayed for that school. And what's going to happen is is they'll receive the letter that we prayed for their school. Last year was a little over a 1,000 schools we prayed for and not one shooting and there was not one problem in those schools. <laughs> Illinois and Indiana, everybody say schools. So everybody be a missionary, just go up. You don't have to ask them, just go up and pray for the, the building, turn the name in, whether it's a Christian school, charter school, whether it's a public school, whether whatever school it is, we want our children safe. And the Bible says, we have not because we ask not. I'm gonna say that again. The Bible says, you have not because you ask not. And when we ask him to make our school safe, I'm believing that God is gonna do just that. And everybody shout a great big amen. The other thing I wanna emphasize is that a week from Monday is gonna be Labor Day prayer. I just want to get everybody to help me here. When we had Memorial Day prayer, it was a great crowd. And we filled this auditorium up at 6 o'clock. Well, this, this Labor Day prayer, I want you to go on a mission. I want you to get people. I want you to call them. Tell them to come from out of town. This is the most important prayer meeting because we are days away from Rosh Hashanah. This is the prayer, Labor Day prayer. We pray for a good winner. We pray for the gasoline to come down. And I want to tell you, if anybody's paid any attention, we've had some good winners in the last 10 years, and the gasoline has come down. We anoint every car as tires, and we pray for every student, and so we are believing that God is going to do a great work in somebody that believes in prayer, say, Labor Day prayer. And this is, and, I, and that means everybody, everybody, children, everybody come to Labor Day prayer. I want to talk about, I want to talk about because in the next few Wednesday nights, as we approach, as we go into, as we go into Rosh Hashanah, the darkest night of the year, on September 14th and September 15th of this year, both nights will have no moon. You look on the moon calendar, it is the only time of the year in which two nights are without a moon. That is on purpose because God designed that that would be the new head year of a Jewish calendar. Now, you and I live by a Gregorian calendar, but God does not live by a Gregorian calendar, which simply means January through December. God lives by a Jewish calendar, and the Jewish calendar is the biblical calendar. And the beginning of a brand new year, this year, will be September 14th, 2023. There will be no moon that night. The second night, there will be no moon. It is considered the two nights, which is the beginning of a new year, which starts out with darkness. And this is very important because when you begin to follow the scriptures, you'll begin to understand how God is teaching us about seasons. You will understand that the Bible teaches concerning that in the first month of what he's going to do. Now what is important when it says night, when it says darkness, that's referring to Rosh Hashanah, the night in which the trumpets will be blown. This is referred to either the blowing of the trumpets or tabernacles 
we use atonement or Rosh Hashanah. All of those are mixed into the same season that lasts for 17 days. On September 14th, that will begin the blowing of the trumpets. In Israel, for thousands of years, and even today, they will blow the shofar, and they will blow it over and over and over again. You will notice in scriptures, if you follow it closely, that that's when judgment begins. In other words, God opens the books up on the day of Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of a new year. He blows the trumpets, or they blow the trumpets to announce it's a brand new year. And chauffeurs are blown all around the world. And we begin to experience and understand what the chauffeur represents, which is the type of a trumpet. What God is saying is, I am blowing the trumpets on Rosh Hashanah, the books are open, and that's when I'm going to place judgment upon the bad and the good. Not talking about the white throne judgment. I'm not talking about us going to heaven and being judged. I'm talking about that Rosh Hashanah, God puts judgment upon the evil and upon the good. You will note if you study the Jewish Talmud and you study the Jewish ways, it was always the Jews that said these words on the day of Rosh Hashanah. That's when Satan, the accuser of the brethren, will come before God and he will announce your sins. He will do everything he can to get God in a position that judgment will come upon you. Now on that day of Rosh Hashanah, since it is the darkest night and then the next night it is the darkest night, God always in scriptures refers to it as darkness as we will read in just a moment. What happens then is Satan full forcibly goes and begins to accuse all of us of our wrongdoings to God. You will notice in the book of Job that the Bible says that Satan came before God and he told God about Job. He said, if you will take your heads down from Job, I can get him to cuss you out. I can get him to stop coming to church. I can get him to stop giving. If you would just let me have a few moments with him, he's not as perfect as you think. When you study scriptures in the book of Job, you will find it happened on the day of Rosh Hashanah. The two darkest days is when Satan came. Now, the Talmud begins, which is a Jewish understanding of scriptures, and when you begin to dissect and begin to read about Rosh Hashanah, you will also find that the Jews would blow a hundred chauffeurs in the city of Jerusalem. And God wanted that to be done to confuse the devil, to get him in a ray of distortion because Satan knows there's a trumpet gonna blast. There is a chauffeur that's gonna blast and Satan knows it's judgment. In other words, he knows God is going to open the books. There is the book of evil, there is the book of good, and then there's the book of the past. And he opens those books, and Satan knows that judgment is going to be cast upon the person that has not given their tithes last year, meaning that God will say, judgment will come upon you this year, and what you did last year, you thought you did good, but you cheated me, so judgment will come upon you, and the curse will be upon you for the next 12 months. That's the reason why you don't play with God's money. You may think that you can cheat God and, and you can get out of it, but you can't cheat God. When you begin to look and God begins to look at the books on Rosh Hashanah, it's the beginning of a new year. What you want God to do is you want God to look at you and say, I'm not going to put judgment on you. I'm going to put blessing upon you. Anybody want blessing? So you read, uh, you read about the blowing of the shofar. When did that happen? When was the first time that that happened? 
because it is connected with us. The first time it happened is when Israel left Egypt and God then told Moses, come up to Mount Sinai. You will find that that's where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. But then you remember that Moses came down and broke the commandments and then he went back up and God gave him more commandments. So when you talk about Rosh Hashanah, there was the blowing of the shofar. In fact, the Bible says God blew it, not man. You read in scriptures that the Bible says that God blew the horn so loud, calling Moses up to Mount Sinai, that the people screamed and said, Moses, it's unbearable, because the Bible said that the shofar who God, he blew it, it got louder and louder and louder. That was the only time that God ever blew the shofar, or in the Bible it is considered a trumpet, even though the shofar is called the shofar, it is also considered a trumpet. Meaning, God blew the trumpet for the first time when he called Moses up. He doesn't blow it anymore until the Bible tells us there's another time he's going to blow it. When he blows it the second time, we're going to do just what Moses did. We're going to go up. And in a few minutes, I will read the scriptures to show you that's when the rapture is going to take place. So the priest and, uh, and the Jews would blow the shofars in Jerusalem and in their communities. They would get a hundred shofars blowing. And it would confuse the devil because the devil then would be confused on what sound and what's going on because they did not want the devil to stand before God to accuse the brethren. For the Bible said he is the accuser of the brethren. Today when you woke up, Satan was screaming your name and he was accusing you of all the things that you have done in your life. And he was, he was ripping you apart. But I've got good news for you is that you have an advocate which is Jesus Christ our Lord and his blood covers us daily. Anybody got the blood of Jesus on your life? So watch how this works. In a few weeks, judgment's coming. Already it's beginning to happen. If you study Jew Jewish Talmud, you will find that the, the bloating of the horn started in the month of August, or would be started, it's already started in the month of August, meaning that 30 days out before Rosh Hashanah, the head of a new year, the blowing of the trumpets, that's the blowing of the trumpets, and, and, and when you hear blowing of the trumpets, that means that's Rosh Hashanah, that's a new year, that's a new season. It also represents the birthday of the earth. God designed that Rosh Hashanah would be at the time in which he created the heavens and the earth. And he created it in such that there was a 10 day period, we go through one through seven, but actually you read verse one and verse two of Genesis, and, and, and there's a whole lot of revelation between uh, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. But you will find that God, when you begin to add it up, you will find that God created man on the day of atonement, which was the sixth day, which means that before, before, the, you know, when it was chaotic and it was without void and in the darkness, there we go again, read it, in the darkness, God in the darkness blew the sound and began to create the earth. And he's never deviated, he's never deviated that every time Rosh Hashanah happens because he created the moon, he created the sun, he created the stars, he created the ocean, and he created so that the moon would not shine for two nights to let everybody know darkness is coming, you better get ready, judgment is going to hit the earth. Now we think that judgment's not hit, that judgment is going to happen, but that's not a fact. God makes decisions on Rosh Hashanah. There is a blowing of the shofar. It will be dark. Let me show you what I mean. In the book of Joel will be just one passage of many passages. In Joel 2, you will find this to be read in the first verse. 
it says these words, blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let up, by the way, holy mountain would really represent the church or the believers that believe in God, Israel. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. That's that sinner, saint, Jew, Gentile. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Now this was before, this is in the Old Testament. There was no such thing as rapture. There was no new covenant that Jesus had come and he was the Lamb of God. We're still under the law. So when he says, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand, he's about to tell you when it's going to come. So now watch, look there, let all the inhabitants, everybody say, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is saying right now, you need to tremble. That's the reason why things are happening with inclement weather and it's going to get worse in the next 20 days. Maui is burned down. They hadn't had a hurricane in Southern California in 87 years and in the midst of that, they had an earthquake. In other words, the land is trembling right now. Your family is trembling right now. In fact, most of you won't admit it and you don't have to admit it because you can do your own battle and you can defeat the enemy because you don't have to sound to anybody what you're going through. But let me tell you, everybody here is going through something because there's a trembling going on right now. It's in your family. It's on your job. Things are just going out of whack. Pressure is on your mind. Am I talking to anybody? And just think, what, what in the world? What, what's going on? My family's acting funny. My dog is even acting funny. The fish in the gold, in the, in the fish bowl are swimming different and things are not quite, anybody know what I'm talking about? He is telling us, he is giving us the calendar of events that Rosh Hashanah has come. Put that back on there, please. Thank you. And, and he says, let the land tremble. And it says, the day is at hand. The Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Look at the next verse. He describes the night. He describes Rosh Hashanah, the day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness as a morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and strong. There hath been, uh, not been ever like. Neither shall there be any more after it, even the years of many generations. He go, he's describing here, it's Rosh Hashanah, two days of darkness. He also goes on and starts telling you there are good things as well as bad things that are going to happen. I don't know about you, but I want to be on the good side of the Lord. I, I want to prepare myself for the good things of God. Now, you will, you will read the second chapter, and then God then says, now, this darkness that's coming, this darkness that's coming, I'm coming. I am coming. I am coming with judgment. I am coming. Satan knows that. So Satan does not want you to be blessed. You are not blessed because you're perfect. You're blessed because you believe. So let me work on that a little bit so everybody can clap their hands at once. You are not being blessed because you're perfect. You're being blessed because you believe. Your faith is, I know that I made a mistake yesterday, but when tomorrow comes, I am not going to make that mistake because God is going to give me the strength and I'm going to be an overcomer. You see, the Bible talks about we're overcomers in every, every aspect of our life. And the Bible says we are overcomers by the word of our testimony. In other words, yes, I did lie 10 weeks ago, but I'm not lying now. And yes, I stole a year ago, but I'm not stealing now. In other words, God is saying, believe in me, if you have faith in me, that is what is going to bring righteousness to you. Now look at this. The Bible says because Abraham, Jesus hadn't died, there was no per perfect blood, there was no grace uh, as far as, as, as sin being uh, forgotten after it was forgiven by God. But Abraham, even in the Old Testament, the Bible says that God, even he, and he wasn't perfect. Abraham was not perfect. And the Bible said in the New Testament about Abraham, because the Bible says, because in the Old Testament, that because Abraham believed, 
God automatically gave them a credit card called righteousness. Or let, let me put it this way. Imputed righteousness. What is imputed righteousness? That's in the book of Romans. Imputed right. What is that? Imputed righteousness is Jesus saying, you don't deserve it. I know you made the bill of sin, but I'm going to pay for the bill of sin. So I'm going to put you in right standing. I'm going to take all the blame. I'm going to take the, the, the blunt of it. And when God asks you, ask you for your lamb, you're going to say, Jesus, because I'm the one that's going to save you, redeem you, because you can't be saved by your own works. But if you will just believe, I'm not asking you to be perfect, but if you just believe, I will give you a credit card of righteousness and it will put you in right standing. Oh, you're still not excited about that. In other words, in other words, when I'm doing wrong and everybody else puts me down, I can believe that God is going to touch my life, make a new creature out of me, fill me with the Holy Spirit, and what, and what I used to do, I'm not doing anymore, not because of my own power, but God comes on the inside of me, puts me in a position of right standing. This is what righteousness means. You're in right standing. Are you perfect? No. Was Abraham perfect? But, but, but the Bible says, Pastor in Romans, that Abraham never staggered at the promises of God. Ah, let's take a look at that. He never staggered at the promises of God, but the boy staggered. Oh, you didn't get that. You're smarter on this side of the auditorium for some reason. He never staggered at what God said. He never argued with what God said, but he messed up royal. Just like you. But don't lose your belief. Don't lose your faith in what God said. I know there, there might be some people here tonight looking around and saying, they shouldn't be worshiping God. They shouldn't be shouting. Why, that hypocrite over there, I know what they have done. I know exactly what. What are they doing that for? And let me just tell you, we're not shouting because we, you know, that we're in this place of condemnation and that we did sin and we shouldn't have done it, etc. We're shouting tonight because God has made a provision that what you know about me and what I did wrong, he's made a provision that I'm going to be redeemed. I'm going to be in right standing. And it, I don't give a rip of what you think about me. Well, I almost got everybody. Let me work on it more. That's the reason why you can't you cannot divorce yourself from it. That says it in the Bible. I believe it. Do I understand it? Absolutely now. How in the world can you take God and him subdivide himself in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and then turn around and say, they're all one, there's not three, but they're all in one. I don't understand it when Jesus said, when you see me, you've seen the Father. I don't get it. I, I, it sounds to me like he's talking to somebody else and somebody else is talking to him. But when God says there's only one God and he only says his name is Jesus, and he, he's fathering creation, son, and redemption, and Holy Spirit, and regeneration. I don't know why the egg has got yolk and yellow, and I'm just going to eat it. I'm not going to sit there and say, I don't know about the white. I don't know about the yellow. I don't know what the rooster did to the hen and how she laid it and all of that stuff. I can't figure all of that. But I am not expected to understand it. I am expected to believe it. I walk by faith. I don't walk by works. Although if I walk by faith, I will get better and better and better. As long as I don't have you as a stumbling block and you just keep criticizing me for everything I do. If you just pray for me, I can get back up. For a just man will fall seven times, but he will get back up every seven times. Get your foot off my neck. Get your foot off my body. I'm, I'm trying to make it. Oh, I failed yesterday, but I'm going to be an overcomer tomorrow.
and how am I an overcomer? The Bible tells you. You're an overcomer by the word of your testimony. You're right. I did commit adultery. You're right. I did get a divorce. You're right. I was a drunk. You're right. I did drugs. You're right. I lied, stealed, and did everything you can imagine. You're right. You know my past. But what you need to know is I've got revelation of my future. I am washed in the blood of Jesus. I am saved and sanctified. And I'm going to testify whether you like it or not. We, in my daddy and mama's church, there was a lady, she talked in tongues on Sunday night. I said, man, that's the most spiritual woman I've ever seen. And then I went to Tops. In those days, we had Tops on Indianapolis Boulevard. We didn't have Kmart then. We had Tops. And that was the shopping paradise in Northwest Indiana. Tops. It burned down, but that was it. Tops. It was over there by Wicker Park. And it was the biggest thing going. Traffic was everywhere. And she would speak in tongues and shake. And power of God would come upon her. She'd get to the counter. I happened to be there one night when she cussed the cash register out. (laughs) Us kids started calling her bananas because she had a lot of bananas that time that she was buying. And so we just made up a nickname, there's bananas. And on Sunday night, she'd just talk in tongues and just shake and we'd say, my God, what bananas are just, well, what is wrong, bananas? Knowing that she was, that we saw her in action with her flesh. Now, we judged her at that moment, but who knows that she was trying to work and to break the habit and live by faith. And, and I was too little to understand it. I just could only judge what I saw and so, et cetera, et cetera. We have to be careful. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking to be repeated sin. I'm not talking about people that know better and won't do better, but say, I slipped. I shouldn't have done that. I'm going to do better. I want, I want Jesus to know that I love him. And, and, and Lord, I, I believe I, I'm not where I should be, but I'm going to get to where you want me to be. So the fact is, it's coming. He warns us it's coming. That's the reason why all of you are going through what you're going through. That's the reason why the Satan has gone crazy. You should see the book that Satan has made on all of your lives. All of your lives. It's taken all the stuff down. He is screaming accusations. He cannot wait till Rosh Hashanah. He knows God's going to open the books. He wants to be there to be the prosecuting attorney to indict you. That's a famous word now. You, you, and to indict you. And, and get you into a position where that you can't function. So God says, here comes Rosh Hashanah. It's a brand new year. God looks at your past and sees what's happening. He blows the trumpet. Judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. But here's what he said. He said, I'm going to give you 10 days to repent. So on the day of Rosh Hashanah, He gives you 10 days to repent. Okay, let's go. You don't believe me. You skipped that part in Joel. 12th verse in the same chapter what we just read today. 12th verse. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn even with me all of your heart with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. Rend your heart and your garments and turn unto the Lord. 13th verse. Turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger. Hallelujah. Not enough hallelujahs. I didn't hear enough hallelujahs. You better get the hallelujah out of your mouth. Slow to anger. Hallelujah. Let me say that again. Slow to anger. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, well, we could back up, for he is gracious. He is merciful. Hallelujah. Open your mouth up. Say it to him. Oh, thank God you're merciful. Oh, my God. Thank you, Lord. You're gracious. Thank you, sir. Slow to anger and great kindness and, and repented him of evil. Thinking about doing evil, but repented because 
Because what are you doing for the next 10 days? You're preparing your heart. You're getting ready. Ready for what? You're getting ready and saying, Lord, Lord, I don't, I don't want the prosecuting attorney of Satan to hold my past. I'm repenting. I'm asking you to forgive me. So there's 10 days of repentance. Then comes the day of atonement, which will be the 24th. And God then, right then and there, will write in the books on how you handle the 10 days of, of prayer, fasting, and seeking him. Now here's the good part. The good part, God says, I just want all of my children to know that if you'll turn to me with all of your heart, I'm gonna put double portion on your life. I, I'm not just gonna answer your prayers a little bit. I'm gonna double up on my answer in your prayers. And when you read the uh, second chapter of Joel, you will find that he says, I started on the first month and, I, and I'm getting ready. Now watch it. This is the blowing of the trumpets. And so, and so the key is, let us go to, let us go to first Thessalonians. Let's jump over to the New Testament. Let's see if, if there is any uh, resemblance of uh, this coming to Rosh Hashanah, the end of the earth, into the world. So we, we go to First Thessalonians. This is in the New Testament. And Paul is referring, he is saying, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Now look there, a heaven with a shout. The same shout he gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. Remember that God has not blown a trumpet since he called Moses up. The second time he blows the trumpet and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, the dead in Christ, people who have died in the faith. Next verse says, the Bible, that they're gonna be caught up, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with him. Will he do that on the first day of Rosh Hashanah? No simply because he's going to give you 10 days to repent. On the Day of Atonement, and I'll, and I'll do this next week, I'll show you exactly what happens on the Day of Atonement of going to the Holies of Holies, which is very, very pertinent for all of us to understand. The fact is, is on the Day of Atonement, God will make the decision. He will make the decision about what's going to happen. Let's go over to 1 Thessalonians and get some more on this. Is there, is there more on this thing of uh, a trumpet and all that? Let's go to 1 Thessalonians, uh, 1 Thessalonians and we're going, to the, um, we're going to the 15th chapter. And here it says these words. In the 51st verse, it says, 51st verse of 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. 1 Corinthians 15 and 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. He's talking about some of us are going to be alive. And when he talks about sleep, he's talking about those that have died. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. What do you mean? Next verse. In a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, in a fifth of a second, watch the last trump. In other words, God's blown the trumpet once. This will be the last trumpet he blows. Rosh Hashanah is the season of the Feast of Trumpets. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible and shall be changed. Meaning dead people who went to the dust of the ground will automatically get their bodies back. But it will be a new body. It, they'll look the same, but it'll be a new body. Only those that are born again. This all happens in a fifth of a second. The next verse says... The next verse says, uh, uh, in the uh, 53rd verse, it says, um, let me read it. Uh, it uh, they don't have it, so I'm going to read it. Um, uh, 53rd verse, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. What does that mean? That means that we no longer will sin, we will know each other, but, 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 but we will not have any, any weak flesh. We won't think, in fact, uh, the marriage thing, uh, and the sexual thing, that's completely, we go to another level. The Bible says we don't know where we shall be, but we know when he shall appear, we shall be like him. 
You remember they could run their hands through him. Remember he could walk through walls. Remember you're about, when, when this rapture takes place, you're going to fly faster than any plane that's ever been built. Any military plane. You break the sound barrier. You're going to fly. And don't worry about flying. So I'm, I'm nervous about flying. You're, you'll be changed. And you'll have power to go here and to go there. You're going to be just like Jesus. Let's, and, and it goes on and it says, so when this corruptible shall I put on incorruption and this mortal shall I put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Meaning it's over with for the devil. It's done. Death is done. We're, we're out of here. The rapture has taken place. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. And, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be unmovable, always abounding in the Lord, in the work of the Lord, in the work of the Lord. I want to know what you're doing in the kingdom. God didn't save you to sit down and just wait for the bus to come and get you to go to heaven. What are you doing? Are you giving? Are you sponsoring? Are you volunteering? What are you doing in the kingdom? Always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. Anybody that puts their effort in the kingdom are the highest paid people on planet earth. Reverse. I'm gonna repeat that again. The highest people that are paid on planet earth are volunteers in the kingdom. Let's go back again. The highest paid people on planet earth are the volunteers that are in the kingdom because your labor is not in vain. God is going to bless you. Now, let's sum this up so we can, we can get out of here in time and we continue this. We continue what's getting ready to happen. So don't, don't worry about when you wake up in the morning, there's a catastrophe. It's going to happen. It's probably going to happen this week. I don't know where or what. You're going to say, ooh, it happened. It happened Monday morning of, uh, uh, to California. It, it happened to Nevada. It happened uh, to Maui. Th that's going to happen. There's, we don't know where it's at, but the whole earth is trembling right now. Now let me, sh let me show you in conclusion how detailed God gets in 1 Thessalonians, this is New Testament, and the fifth chapter. And this will, if you have followed me closely, and, and uh, we just got a new shipment of the seven blessings of, uh, of the atonement. Get it. Listen, I'm not, we're not trying to sell books here. Uh, there was one ministry that ordered, I think, 5,000 of these. And, Another ministry, 2,500 of these. I'm not, I'm not trying to make money on them. Uh, they're $10. They should be sold for 100 All the work I did for years and all of that, you can't believe it. You get it in a setting of two cheeseburgers if you can get it that cheap anymore. Here is 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. Here, 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 listen to this. Listen. Okay, now you all know the dark day's coming, right? When's it coming? This year it's coming, the 14th and 15th, right? Darkness is coming. The beginning of a new season's coming with darkness. Notice that the earth was created out of darkness. Ready? Now watch what Paul says. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. What is he saying? This is 1 Thessalonians, the first chapter. They need to see this. 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. Now look at this. Paul is saying, I don't need to talk to all of you. You all know the seasons of Passover. Pentecost and Rosh Hashanah or atonement or feast. You, you know about this. He's telling us, you should know about this. Passover has already been fulfilled. Jesus came and fulfilled it. Pentecost has already been fulfilled. The church started. The only one that has not been fulfilled, even though we could first time Jesus was born on the day of atonement, but it has not been fulfilled as far as him coming back. He's going to come back. He's going to come back. We're headed for darkness on the 17th, uh, September 14th. You got 10 days to get your act together. 
to repent. He gives us that chance. On the Day of Atonement, he will make the decision. On the Day of Atonement, he created man. On the Day of Atonement, he closed the door of the ark and destroyed the world. On the Day of Atonement, Jesus was born. I could go through uh, Day of Atonement when Abraham uh, offered up his son, and, 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 and that was on the Day of Atonement. I, I, could go through, I could go through history after history what happens on the Day of Atonement, okay? So don't walk out here and say, oh, on the Day of Atonement, when the Lord's going to come back. No, I can't say that because nobody knows the day or the hour. It'd be stupid for me to say that because of the fact that there's a different day in Japan than it is here. And it's a different hour here than it is L.A. or uh, London. So you can't say that. But, but he will make the decision. And then there is eight days after atonement, which he tells, and we'll talk about that, which is now the Feast of Tabernacles in which he says, look up, get outside, party, have fun. You've repented. The books are open. I've cleared the deck. You're ready to go and get ready. I could come back. If he comes back, it will be this season. No doubt about it. Why? Because the Bible says, I wish they would get that on the screen because you, you would believe me because if you don't have your Bible, First Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, first verse. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. You have no need. Season. Everybody say seasons. Now watch the sequence. Watch it. And then we're going to end this. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in, what's the last word? He's talking about Rosh Hashanah. He's talking about the two darkest days of the year. Well, somebody get it. Don't stare at me like, oh, oh, oh wow. That's, that's the night he's talking about. You want me to read on? Ah, they shall say peace and safety and then sudden destruction. He's saying, you better be careful who you're hanging with. And everybody says, ah, that ain't going to happen. I've been hearing Jesus is coming 50 years ago. Just keep living on. Keep just getting drunk. Keep on committing your sex sins. Keep on doing your drugs. Ah, that ain't going to happen. And he says, for when they shall say peace and safety, sudden destruction come upon them. And he, and he gives the illustration that it's, it's going to happen just like a woman who is with child and her water breaks and boom, it hits. That's what he says there. Then the next verse, listen to this, watch this, watch it. But ye, brethren, are not of darkness. There we go. Oh, there's a darkness again. What's he talking about? He's talking about Rosh Hashanah, the season of atonement. You, brethren, you're not in darkness. That that day should overtake you as a thief. What's he saying? This is the season I'm going to come back. You should know that. You, you're not. God. Listen, listen, listen. Listen, I know when I grew up, when I grew up, every Sunday night I went to the altar at 10, 9, 5, 7. Oh God, forgive me. Every time the moon was red, I thought it turned to blood and Jesus was coming. I was scared most of my life because I thought Jesus was going to come. And when I cussed accidentally or on purpose in, in school, I really said, Lord, please forgive me. Okay? Most of my life, I... Uh, I, I, I was concerned about he could come because I was preached to he could come at any time. Then I was preached to all of my life. I'm almost done here, so get this. And it's in the Bible. In an hour that you think not, the Son of Man cometh. I used to freak out as a teenager. There were at least eight hours today and I didn't think one hour of those eight hours he was coming back. For the Bible says, in an hour that you think not, the Son of Man cometh. And I would even, as a young preacher, I would say, I must train myself that every hour I'm awake, I got to say, this could be the hour. You can't live that way. I don't care how old you are. In fact, the holiest people I know don't even think about the rapture for months and some years. God is not trying to, to get us so frenzy scared. Oh my God, oh Jesus, oh God. He gives us a season. 
Oh, come on, you need to. He gives us a season. He tells you it's going to be dark. You guys know what time it's going to be. It's the beginning of a brand new year. You got to repent for 10 days. It's in darkness. And you guys know I'm going to come as a thief. But you already know that, so wake up. That's what he's saying. Are you getting this? I'm, I'm, I, hurry up and get it because I got to quit here. Uh, let me read on. And he's dealing with his season. Remember, the, fir the, fir the, 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 the first verse starts with season. Look, look what he says. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Fourth verse. Five. Ye are the children of light and the children of day. You are not of night nor of darkness. You're not worried about that darkness. You know exactly, this is the beginning of the blowing of the trumpets. I'm going to get my act together and I'm going I'm to pray fast. I'm going to get some things done in my life. Then he says, therefore, let us not sleep as do others. Meaning that people who are saved have the ability to have spiritual encephalitis. And most of the church, I don't want to be condemning here, but most of the church has got syphilitis. You know what that is? You can sleep washing dishes. You can drive a truck with stuff like and, 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 and truck drivers will tell you, I don't even remember where I've been today, and drive a truck for eight hours because you go through the same motions all the time. And you've been going through the same motions all the time and nothing has disturbed your situation until you rock yourself to sleep. And Paul is saying, don't let that syphilis, don't let that disease get a hold of it. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. And let us watch and be sober. The next verse, you'll love this. The next verse, for they that sleep in the night, they're drunken, they're drunkards, they're drunk on life. They're drunk on prosperity. They are drunk. They're not going to wake up. They're drunk on their money. They're drunk on their pleasures. They are drunk. And they can come to church and clap their hands and still be drunk. They can still say I'm a Christian but have no idea where they are and what time it is. I want to wake up. Somebody blow the trumpet. Wake me up. Wake. Hey, 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 hey. Next verse. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation, because double portion is coming. If Jesus doesn't come back, ah, that's all right. I'll rejoice anyway. But I know that I'm going to step into a double portion in my life. Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. More to come. Everybody say, more to come. How many's learned something tonight? Wave your hand, Sam. So this is the time for adjustments. It's a time for adjustments. Tonight we're going to take our offering. We're going to take our Wednesday night offering. Love to take our Wednesday night offering from Wednesday night people who love to give Wednesday night offerings. People who love to tithe, who love to give offerings. And I want to encourage you tonight, adjust, get some adjustments. As you close out the year of God, that you say, God, I want to believe. I want to do what's right. I want you all blessed. I want you all blessed. How many want to be blessed? How many want to be blessed? There's some things money can't buy. I'm going to say it again. Some things money can't buy. I know people, I, I know people, I've read about people, have all the money in the world, they commit suicide. Kill themselves. How do you kill yourself when you got all the money in the world? Evidently that didn't make them happy. God makes you happy. There's nothing wrong with having all the money in the world. But that shouldn't be your God. I give my tithes. I give my offerings. God's saying, I, I, I really want to bless you. And I'm the guy, I'm the guy, I'm the watchman on the wall that has to say, hey, everybody, 
We better obey God. Because about the time you think that you're getting by with it, everything's going to crumble right before your face. Because as fast as God gave it to you, he can take it away. You mark it down in the next, in the next portion of your life, one accident, one heart attack, one blood clot, something turned in until you can't function. All of a sudden you have a stroke because you think. And let me tell you something. Be careful what you worship. Because that's the thing that's going to heal you. So be careful you don't worship your car, your house, things, high heels. You, you might could worship that, I'm not sure. Be careful. Because you know what God's going to do? When you're struck down and the enemy comes after you, God will say, what you worship, ask it to heal you. What you gave to. You love that more than you love me. Ask it if it'll heal you. But isn't it a good feeling to know, God, I have obeyed you. And God says, thank you for making me your God. Because if you'll make me number one, I'll give you everything you want. Make me number one. It's coming. Things are happening. And I want to tell everybody here tonight, you better get ready because there's a boatload of stuff God's getting ready to do. It's going to blow your mind. And God always likes to show off his people when it's the hardest in the economy for other people to say, how come you made it? How come you're doing good? So tonight we have that opportunity to give. I'm excited to give. Thank you. Thank you. Singers, you did great tonight. Thank you for this word of God. Thank you. Thank you. So everybody here tonight, get your phones out. Some of you are really good at this. Get your phones out. And then all of you that are like me, get an envelope. Then all of you that are writing checks, let me help you with spelling. H-U-N-D-R-E-D. I'm sorry. T-H-O-U-S-A-N-D. No, F-I-F-T-Y, whatever God speaks to you. As you begin to now give to him, everybody, and then we'll pray and go. Everybody, everybody, we're giving now. We're giving to the Lord. Ushers, thank you, ushers. And Lord, this is a moment. Sing for us as we give to God, as we give to God. You that are watching me, let us give right now. Join in with us as we give to God. Thank you, Jesus. tell you soon about that miracle. God is doing great things. 
Everybody get ready. Get the word out. Get the word out. We got a few days left. I want God to bless all of you. We're going to give our atonement offering the end of September. Lift your right hand and say, Oh God, I thank you for righteousness. Thank you for atonement. Thank you. You love me and forgive me. I'm learning, God. I want to learn more. I want to be ready. In the name of Jesus. Everybody you set your hand and say, Lord, bless this offering. We should say these words. Lord, bless my offering. Lord, bless my offering. I give it to the kingdom. I give it to the kingdom. Receive it now. Receive it now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Can you take that right there? One last thing. It is a compliment that all of you came tonight. Did you hear? He's gone now, but you, and he told me, he said, I'm coming back. Senator Mike Brown said, I've never been in anything like this. He said, and I like it. Thank you for lifting up Jesus, not being ashamed of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Everybody shout a great big Jesus. Jesus. Turn to somebody and say, double portions coming on you. God bless you. See you Sunday. Sunday. Wow, wasn't the service great? I love the part when the flag was dropped. We don't usually do that, but we just, we just felt the urgency to pray for America, to pray for our leaders. The Bible teaches us that we must pray for those in authority. We pray for our policemen, we pray for our firemen, we pray for our, our congressmen, our mayors, our governors. It's important that we do that. Tonight, thank you for joining with our faith to ask God to touch our leaders. Um, it was so good. And then the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord as we near, as we near uh, the time in which Jesus is going to come back. We learned so much tonight about the blessings and how that God He's going to pour his blessings out, but at the same time, how he instructs us, we better repent. And tonight, uh, we heard these words, and I, this is what I want to encourage everybody to do. You make up in your mind in the next three weeks, next two and a half weeks, Lord, every service, I am going, I am really going to make an effort to pray more, going to make an effort, Lord, to make sure my giving is in place. And then, of course, we're getting ready for the atonement offering. That's at the end of September as we lay it on the Ark of the Covenant on the Day of Atonement. But, oh God, I want to prepare my heart. He's coming back. It really is true. He's coming back. I don't know the day or the hour. I just know the season in which he comes back. Whatever you're going through, I want to tell you, it's a sign that God is going to do a great miracle in your life. There, there's just no doubt about it. You say, I'm suffering this way, and I'm suffering with this, and I've got this situation, and money, and relation, and job, and I'm under, I'm under severe pressure. I have a sickness, I have a children. I just want you to note, God knows that. And as we learn tonight, God is going to help us if we enter into obedience. I'm excited. I'm excited about your blessing. And I always know that what I'm going through, and I personally mean myself, myself, my family, being attacked. But we smile about it because we say, we're not ignorant of the devil's devices. We know what's going on. God's getting ready to bless us. And if I'm not careful, I will yield to the devil's devices and he will get me into fear and into doubt and I will abort. I will abort. I, I won't be able to get my blessing, so I gotta stay strong with my faith. So I wanna encourage you, Sunday's gonna be great. For your children, for the nursery, for you, 
Sunday's going to be great. And then next Wednesday night, I'm dealing with the seven blessings. If you don't have the book, you can get it at the bookstore, our bookstore, Family Christian Center bookstore. And I just believe, I believe with all my heart that uh, there's something on the horizon for you. I feel that as I'm speaking to you. God's going to be so great. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank God for every viewer. I thank God for every person. Let it be, let the ushering of your presence be in their life in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let me just tell you that if you are a member of another church in another city or another country, make sure you give your tithes to that church, church local church. But you can give us an offering. That would be great. And you can see that right now. Because your offerings keep streaming the lights, the camera, people that uh, operate them. And I would like to say that streaming is free. Now, you may be on your computer and you may get it free. But for us to send it to you, it's not free. I wish it was, but it's not free. It is a nominal cost. And we appreciate that we're able to do it. So if God speaks to you, God speaks to you says, you know, I'm going to give the ministry an offering to do that. If you're not giving your tithes anywhere, then plant your tithes in this house so you can be blessed. I appreciate you. God appreciates you. And remember, yes, you can.